After the Civil War, America experienced a huge increase in new ideas and inventions. Between 1860 and 1890, there were 500,000 patents issued for new inventions, as opposed to 36,000 between 1790 and 1860. This period is known as the Industrial Revolution. The Transcontinental Railroad was developed by Leland Stanford, completed on May 10, 1869, when Stanford drove in the last Golden Spike. The railroad connected the east and the west coast of the U.S. and allowed people to travel faster without having to switch onto different trains to get places. This, help, this helps people communicate, which probably helped promote other inventions too. It helps farmers by causing shipping costs to drop greatly. They could now transport cattle, flour, and other products faster and cheaper. Example, a barrel of flour dropped from $3.45 to just $0.68. Cents. Just as cities had developed around ports, western cities and cow towns now clustered around train stations as miners, merchants, and entrepreneurs came swarming in during the gold rush of 1849. Trains required time zones to be set so that all the trains would arrive at the stations at the right times across the country. The telegraph was perfected by Morse in 1844. Even though it was developed by other scientists earlier in the 1700s, the text textbook says the success signaled the start of a communications revolution. The telephone was invented by Alexander Graham Bell, a Scottish immigrant to Boston in 1844. Improvement on the concept of the telegraph allowed people to literally talk to each other. In 1880, Thomas Edison invented the electric light bulb. It completely changed people's lives. Schedules that were once revolved around the rising and setting of the sun were no longer restricted because there was now light to work with in the dark. The alternating current was invented by George Westinghouse in 1885. The textbook says it made, in quote, home use of electricity practical, in quote. It, was trans it transmitted electricity cheaper and more efficiently than before and over longer distances. It made other inventions such, such as the refrigerator possible so people didn't need to store ice anymore and food wouldn't spoil as fast. It also created new jobs with the invention of the electric sewing machine, which were worked by women and children immigrants in the ready-made clothing industry. The Bessemer process was invented independently by Henry Bessemer in England and William Kelly in Kentucky in 1856. This made mass production of steel possible by allowing the removal of impurities and the creation of steel easier and cheaper. Mass production of steel led to the building of skyscrapers like the Empire State Building, bridges like the Brooklyn Bridge, and eventually cars with steel frames. The Brooklyn Bridge, designed by German immigrant and engineer John Roebling, was the longest in the world. It spanned the East River between Brooklyn and Manhattan, and no longer required people to take expensive ferries and it often closed during the winter weather to get their jobs. It was completely by Roebling Sun, May 24, 1883, and became a symbol of American success. Industrialization at the turn of the century produced the robber barons and captains of industry, who both sought to become rich through innovations to make and sell products faster, cheaper than their competitors. But to do this, they needed workers. Between the farmers leaving for the industrial jobs in the city and the immigrants, industrialists had an endless supply of workers to treat as they saw fit. From 1860 and 1900, farmers traded agriculture for industry because of a long drought in 1877, low profits, and higher competition from foreign wheat producers. During the Industrial Revolution, many businessmen believed in social Darwinism, the theory that the government and society should limit the interference of people's pursuit of success. Since the wealth of the rich, or the, in quote, fit, and the removal of the poor, or, in quote, unfit, should benefit the country. This basically means that they wanted to be able to work people as cheap, long, and hard as they could to minimize expenses and maximize profits. Workers were paid very little, and sometimes not by hour, but by production. This was called piecework and favored the youngest and the fastest workers. Without restrictions, workers were forced to work 10 to 12 hours a week with the conditions uncomfortable at best. The workplace was often boring, loud, dark, hot, and dangerous. Fires were frequent because of a combination of faulty equipment, fatigue, and careless training. In 1882, an average of about 675 workers died a week. Now only about 120 workers die a week. 
Bosses were often strict, and they fined for tardiness, talking, back-talking, and refusing an order. Division of labor separated the different operations of the production of something like an assembly line. This was faster and more efficient, but was discouraging to the workers since they did the same thing over and over and never saw the final product. The conditions were just as harsh on children as well. However, the low wages of parents forced the children to work for their family to earn enough money to eat. Children usually didn't attend school past 12 or 13 years old, but sometimes a sister would work so that her brother could continue his education. Mining, which led to the premature deaths of many adults, usually stunted children's bodies and minds with the constant inhaling of contaminated air. The only way to protect children was to limit the hours a day and week children could work and actually enforcing it. Around the 1800s, people decided to leave their homes and immigrate to the United States. They wanted to get away from crop failure, land and job shortages, rising taxes, and famine. Many came to the U.S. because it was perceived as the land of economic opportunity. Many other were looking for personal freedom or relief from political and religious per persecution. Seventy percent of all immigrants entered through New York City, which became known as the Golden Door. Many states that didn't have large populations sought to attract immigrants by offering jobs or land for farming. Many immigrants wanted to move to populations where former immigrants from their homeland had settled. Employers often took advantage of the immigrants. Men were paid less than the other workers, and the women were paid less than the men. The natives often stereotyped and discriminated against many immigrants. They suffered verbal and physical abuse because they were considered different. In the end, newcomers helped transform American society and culture, demonstrating that diversity, as well as unity, is a source of natural strength. The Second Reform Era began during the Reconstruction and lasted until the American entry into World War I. The struggle for women's rights and the temperance movement were the initial issue issues addressed. A farm movement also emerged to compensate for the declining importance of rural areas in an increasingly urbanized America. Progressivism was believed that man was capable of improving the lot of all within society. It was a discard of social Darwinism, the position taken by many of the rich and powerful figures of the day. Most of the reason for the success of the progressive movement was because of the muckrackers, writers who detailed the honors of poverty, urban slums, dangerous factory conditions, and child labor, among a host of other ills. Success began with Interstate Commerce Act, 1887, and the Sherman Antitrust Act, 1890. Progressives never spoke with one mind and differed sharply over the most effective means to deal with the illnesses generated by the trust. Some favored an activist approach to trust busting. Others preferred a regulatory approach. Other progressive reforms followed in the form of a conservation movement, railroad legislation, and food and drug laws. The progressive movement added new amendments to the Constitution, which elected senators, protected society through, through prohibition, and extended suffrage to women.